Welcome everyone. And uh, I will remind everyone that uh, the Farming Basics phone app, um, the uh, first version is out. Uh, it was released just before the pandemic and it's available to you 24 seven. A new improved version should come out in less than a month. Uh, we are beta testing right now, the second version, and that will give you a lot of communication tools. Uh, for example, calling David or any of the regional extension agents uh, will be real easy through the app. You, the app will also connect you easily to our Facebook pages, our IPM newsletter uh, that I have been posting links to in the chat. Um, so all those resources will be available to you uh, and more is in the pipeline. Um, and Andre <clears throat> has the, you know, he's now leading the vegetable commercial as well as the conventional vegetable production program in the team. So uh, you all feel free to reach out to Andre. Uh, he's great to work with and easy to get hold of. So um, just wanted to give you those updates. Uh, I have posted some links to the um, uh, IPM resources in the chat box and also on Facebook. Um, I am shuttling between screens. So let me make sure that I have it correct. Um, but uh, my information is on your screen right now. And uh, again, the main channel we have on Facebook is Alabama Extension Commercial Horticulture. That's where we archive uh, most of our events. And uh, Harley Willis manages those videos on there. We also have uh, on aces.edu, we also have a digital archive. So if you type in digital archive on the uh, search bar on aces.edu, you will be able to find the page uh, where we also keep virtual farm tour recordings. And uh, now this uh, research and uh, various demonstrations are funded by many of the uh, uh, funding agencies that are on your screen. And those include uh, several of the Alabama Department of Agriculture Specialty Crops block grants. So just wanted to mention uh, the funding sources. And I hope that my screen will advance. Hopefully this is going forward. Perfect. So again, these are our uh, team resources. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit slow because I noticed a, a lag here. But uh, these are our free online resources, the Alabama IPM newsletter. We have the Farming Basics online course, which is a great introductory, uh, very good introductory course. It takes about four hours to do it. Uh, of course, the Farming Basics mobile app is available. We also have the Alabama virtual farm tours and commercial horticulture webinar series that go parallel along with these extra events. Uh, like the vegetable school. So uh, look out for these, so a lot going on here. And then uh, if you don't have these, please get hold of me or uh, one of the REAs uh, or come to a extension event near you and grab the physical copies. But we have the uh, new vegetable handbook. Uh, don't use the old ones, try to get the new ones. Uh, we also have the revised organic vegetable IPM slide chart that uh, is also co-authored by Andre. And then we have the urban farm or uh, the home garden IPM toolkit, which is a circular one. That's something you can take to say Home Depot or the co-op if you are shopping for insecticides. So there are lots of good resources here. To start out uh, about insects, just a little bit about uh, the basics of entomology, and then we'll move on to the control part. Um, but <clears throat> over the last few years, we have seen a uh, tremendous increase in, uh, in thrips. And uh, Andre mentioned some of the varieties that are resistant to the tumor spotted wilt virus. But the Western flower thrips is the one that you see uh, very common. It seems to be active throughout the season. And, um, <clears throat> and it transmits the virus very easily. Um, <clears throat> and we have some tests that we do in the lab to confirm whether um, you have the virus. But the first approach to manage this insect is to get uh, varieties that are resistant to the, to, to, to the virus, uh, because you don't need very many of the thrips to infect the plants. So uh, uh, you have to manage the uh, get good varieties. 
Caterpillars, uh, it seems like we have a never ending supply of caterpillars in Alabama. And uh, um, so you see on the top of your screen, the most common armyworm species, uh, the armyworm sisters, as I call it. And uh, the one that you see most active, um, typically the first one is beet armyworm. Uh, it's typically followed by fall armyworms. But last year, 2021, fall armyworms took the central stage. So they stole all the uh, attention of the other armyworms. But these will, uh, will infest tomatoes uh, simultaneously. You will see multiple species. They are easier to identify when they are larger. Uh, the young ones are very difficult to identify. So the coloration is more evident when they're older. So as you can see, these are the older caterpillars and you can tell the difference. We also have the usual uh, suspects, which is the corn earworm or tomato fruit worm, hornworm that everybody loves uh, or not, uh, cabbage loopers and the soybean loopers. So those are some of your older uh, or late stage um, problems in tomatoes. But these caterpillars are tremendous issues and they continue to be major problems um, in our crops. And especially in South Alabama, if you're in um, south of I-85, this heavy incidence of these caterpillars, especially with overlapping generations. And uh, just as a reminder that these caterpillars come from their mothers that lay eggs. And you're looking at some pictures of eggs. And I'm, I put this slide because I get a lot of text pictures with eggs and I'm expected to answer them accurately, which is very difficult as you can see. If I put one of the pictures, it's just almost impossible to tell which of the armyworms these are. They all look the same. But one thing you'll notice here is the armyworms lay eggs in bunches, in masses. And that's very critical. And those, oftentimes those egg masses are, are covered with the body hair or the abdominal bristles from the female. So they look fluffy. So those are the classic uh, armyworm uh, eggs. And then uh, hornworms, fruit worms, and loopers, they lay single eggs. And you'll see, I, I see the hornworm eggs very easily on leaf surfaces in my home garden. Um, and uh, these are very common. But again, these armyworms are, you know, most of these pests are have a wide host range, and that's the issue. Uh, they keep moving between crops. Uh, armyworm infestations often start out with feeding on the leaves. So that's the big picture on, this, on the right hand of your screen uh, with those leaves eaten out. If you don't manage those uh, armyworms on the leaves, they will move on to the fruits and they make these perfect round holes uh, towards the top of the fruit. Uh, and those are the armyworms. So they need to be controlled uh, when they're on the leaves um, and, and then avoid a late season outbreak. Especially if you have crops in high tunnels, uh, these armyworms can spread fast through the high tunnels or, or any escapes in the greenhouses. Other smaller insects that you may see um, are the aphid species. There are several aphid species that will feed on the on tomatoes. And a um, very common one is the potato aphid, which has multiple forms. Again, these aphids come in different colors. Um, and a very good way would be to take good pictures with your phone and text it to David. And the way this works is all the tough questions go to David and the easy ones come to me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you can uh, text the pictures to multiple people and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, but uh, the important thing to remember is if you look at the picture on the top right, um, we don't want to see that happen where the aphids have increased so bad that the leaves are curling. And uh, that's pretty late. And if you are organic producer, home gardener, it's very difficult to control aphids at that late stage, at the outbreak stage. Um, with the home garden or organic products. I'm still struggling to, to make a good organic recommendations. I have some recommendations to slow them down, but 
they are difficult to control with uh, just organic type products. So, uh, and then also I have picture of the aphid mummies, which is the beneficial uh, parasite. So if you see them, uh, that's a good thing. So don't try to kill beneficials along with the pests. So just be careful with that. Um, now aphids and white flies, uh, white flies are also these small flying insects. They look like dust clouds. If you have a real bad outbreak, they look like dust clouds. If you have seen it, uh, it's very common to see it in ornamental plants, um, but it also infests vegetables. Uh, and not only do these insects do direct damage, with the feeding, but they also produce um, honeydew, which leads to sooty mold or blackening of the, of the leaves. And if you are seeing a lot of these blackened leaves, that's pretty late stage because there's no, no way to reverse that blackened leaf. Um, and of course the plant gets sicker uh, if you have uh, the leaves turning black like that. It's very common to see, see this happen fast in greenhouses where you can have uh, infested transplants uh, with aphids and then uh, very quickly plants are uh, turning black. So um, just watch out for these symptoms. And remember insects can damage uh, directly or indirectly. And also we talked about viruses. So um, all these insects can also transmit viruses. That's an indirect um, injury or damage. And of course, nobody loves these insects, I'm sure, which are the sting bugs and leaf-footed bugs. And most, um, almost 70, 80% of our sting bug species are now the leaf-footed bug, which is marked with that orange star on your screen. Um, so that leaf-footed bugs um, and the brown sting bug are the two dominant species that we have. And there are several reasons why they're so bad. And I have those listed on your slide. I'm not gonna read all of them, but these uh, insects move between crops very effectively. They are fast flyers. Um, they are also very good at avoiding treated areas and coming back later. Um, and uh, again, natural enemies, uh, there are fewer of them or they're slow to control them. So taken together, it's a perfect storm. And that's why these leaf-footed bugs have just exploded. Um, and there's a picture uh, on the top from, you know, they, from row crops to vegetable crops. They infest a variety of uh, uh, crops and also fruits. Uh, so these are just major pests and they are very difficult to control organically. I will tell you about one method here real quickly um, to, to kind of reduce their population. Spider mites, if it gets hot and dry, or if you use too much pesticide, two ways you can get spider mites. If you get, if you, if you, if they are induced by pesticides, you have a very uni nice crop of spider mites all across your field. If you, um, if this is induced by drought or some other environmental causes, they're usually clumps uh, or areas of high spider mite activity. So you can almost tell the difference how they were induced. Uh, but there are lots of spider mite species. The dominant one is the two-spotted spider mite. These you cannot identify, or they're sometimes very difficult to identify with naked eyes. You need a good, good hand lens or magnifying glass and uh, then identify because there are several uh, uh, predatory mites that look like them. Uh, we don't want to kill those beneficial mites. So um, you have to be able to identify them. Uh, the other major identification feature is webbing. If you see a lot of webbing, which is pretty late, that means the outbreak has already happened. Uh, those are your pest species. But spider mites are induced by weather and pesticides. So remember that, and they can again spread fast throughout a high tunnel, uh, if you have a high tunnel crop. Uh, and also these will jump between host plants. So again, same problem uh, as of the other caterpillars and, and other species. So what is IPM? Um, I always tell uh, audience that you can forget my name, but don't forget IPM, Integrated Pest Management, which is mainly a decision management system. So you make decisions based on your observations and your experiences. 
and ex your experiences could be different from mine and that's fine. Uh, but making a good judgment is important, uh, whether you need to control the insects or not. And these are some of the steps to IPM. So insect detection and monitoring is the first. Insect identification, like I said, do not kill the beneficials. Population pressure, know when the insect is coming, know the life cycle of the insect. Economic threshold means when you should act. For example, if you have one aphid, you don't need to go out and, and wipe out the entire insect population. You can probably wait and uh, see how the aphid, if the aphid even survives or it leaves the area. So knowing and recording is very important. Natural enemy activity, make sure you are uh, protecting those natural enemies and pollinators. And then finally making a treatment decision. And it's, it's okay if you don't need to treat. Uh, so, so not doing anything is also okay. Uh, but this, of, of course, doing good IPM takes practice uh, and good record keeping. That's very important, even as a gardener. Now, I'm just kind of showing you because we're talking about monitoring, insect detection monitoring. We do insect monitoring programs statewide. And I know there's a lot of numbers on this slide. It's a very busy slide. But what I wanted to show you is if you look at that uh, column of 2021, um, well, first off, you will see on the top of the screen uh, the, the various years and notice how we have cycled between wet to drought and wet. So see how this is all progressing. And we have data going back almost 10 years. Um, last year was an extremely wet year. Uh, I had a hard time scouting my own crops in the field. Uh, and it was a perfect storm for the army worms. And I've marked those army worm populations. If you run your finger on the screen or, and, and, or just look at the numbers uh, across, you'll see why army worms were so bad. Uh, the numbers are incredibly high last year. And that was an early warning system for, for us. And I sent almost five pest alerts through the IPM newsletter, uh, which I have linked to in the chat. Uh, alerting farmers and gardeners. So uh, uh, this is what's happening. This explains why we, we saw tremendous pressures. And of course, squash wine borers, uh, we typically see an early outbreak or er early activity of wine borers, uh, typically around Mar February or March, late February or March, uh, as it warms up, you may start seeing squash wine borers, but they were also incredibly high. So again, this just kind of gives you a snapshot and the benefit of monitoring uh, insects in the long term. And if you're interested, you can also buy uh, these sticky traps uh, for aphids and thrips. And uh, these work really well if you have a greenhouse or a high tunnel. Um, in open fields, sometimes dust becomes a problem, uh, but these colors attract different insects. For example, aphids are very attracted to the yellows, and uh, thrips are very attracted to the dark colors uh, like the blues. So, uh, and then you can also trap flies on, on some of the deep colors, but uh, there are some methods. If you're interested, uh, I, you can call me and we can talk about more methods, uh, but nothing replaces direct scouting. And that's important. You, know, you have to look in the canopy. So again, just a reminder, to stop, look, and identify, do not kill off the beneficial insects. Um, so here are two sting bug species. They look very similar, uh, but once you put them under the microscope or if you have a magnifying lens, you can see that the uh, beneficial insect, which, is, uh, which has the letter A on your screen, that has a very thick, stout uh, beak or mouth. It's very, very thick. And what it does is it pinches the body of caterpillars and sucks the juice out. So it's a beneficial. Uh, whereas the, uh, the pest version is B and there the mouth part uh, is very long and thin. And that's because that mouth is like a straw. It goes into the plants and um, they can suck the juice. So that makes them the pest. So learn to identify these and uh, take good pictures if you can from top as well as a, as a side profile that helps me to tell what these insects are. Uh, but just wanted to kind of uh, mention that. Also, if you see these, now these are pictures from gardeners that come to me a lot, so I've uh, used them. Uh, but if you see 
these hornworms infested with these cocoons of the wasp, leave them alone. That caterpillar is going to die soon. And those uh, parasites will go off uh, and infest other caterpillars, and including army worms. So these are beneficials that we need to protect. You can move them to different parts of the garden, even if you have a large garden, and help them kind of disseminate on their own, um, support them. Also, if you're using biological insects, uh, insecticides, or like Bt, or if you if we see a lot of wet uh, weather with lots of rain, you will see diseased insects like this hornworm that has pretty much dehydrated and died on the leaves. Uh, and that's uh, induced by one of the bacteria. There's also fun fungi, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but fungi um, that also infest um, uh, or infect insects. So those are also important. So we need to protect them. Now, remember drought. If we get into a drought situation, uh, that really stresses the plant. And not only the plants, but it also increases the life uh, or increases the generations, number of generations for insects. And together, drought can have a really serious effect on our crops. So just kind of a reminder that uh, weather can affect uh, uh, your IPM plan. And that's an important uh, aspect of, of good record keeping and using that information to develop your own plan. Um, so just a few things that I, I mentioned. The other thing that uh, I have on the screen is um, when it's too hot and dry, you may see reduced effect of beneficial insects. Um, so that's another issue and, and the pest species take advantage of all this. So it's a perfect storm and droughts are really bad, especially flash droughts are very bad for our crops. Uh, especially crops. When I talk about pest management, uh, so shifting gears to management part, are there any quick questions or is my voice coming through okay? Just a quick check, David. Yes, sir, everything's good. Okay, and yeah, make sure I'm not able to monitor the chat at this point, David, but I'll let you uh, make the list of questions, I'm sure. Uh, but I just wanted to mention, I do have the new IPM slide charts. Uh, I think there are some with David and other REAs uh, that you can get. And th that slide chart is your kind of your, your beginning uh, organic recommendation. So that's not everything, but that gives you some direction. And if you are interested, get one from David or email me and I, I can uh, uh, mail this out to you or grab them at, at an event, a future event. Uh, but there is the new version of the slide chart, which is blue in color. Uh, but this is a kind of an overview of sustainable IPM practices. So there are three levels. Um, so the first one is called systems-based practices. And that's pretty much what Andre covered. Uh, he talked about variety selection, uh, sanitation and weed control. Make sure you are cleaning your field or garden between production seasons and uh, then putting in your fresh crop. Otherwise, insects can uh, build up in the soil or in the environment. Uh, weed control is very important, uh, of course. Irrigation and water management that Andre mentioned. Any stress on the plant is gonna make it worse. Uh, and uh, insects will find those weak plants. So irrigation and water management. It, uh, water management also is important for example, if you are spraying, if you are used to spraying over the top with insecticides, don't sprinkle water over the top after spraying insecticide because it's going to wash away. So again, you have to think about your uh, irrigation system. Uh, in my garden and in our farms, uh, all our experiments, we always have drip tape. I'm a big proponent of drip tape or any kind of uh, uh, metering device or, or delivery system you can use, even soaker hoses just to avoid watering over the plants, over the leaves. Uh, and then trap cropping, that's something I'm going to mention. Trap cropping is very similar to companion planting that you may have read in magazines, but in companion planting, you are uh, harvesting both crops, the main crop and the companion plant. Uh, whereas in trap crop, the trap crop is actually a sacrificial crop. And I'll show you example. Uh, and then uh, level two IPM is pest exclusion or mechanical removal 
And I actually have videos on the Farming Basics phone app that you can watch. Um, there are several videos on the temporary and permanent exclusion systems. And I think the temporary system is very good for home gardeners, small, small farmers, urban farms. Uh, so that's a very, I think pest exclusion has great promise, but you have to learn to do it correctly. Otherwise these systems can backfire on you. Um, and then IPM level three are insecticides, uh, for example, conventional or biorational, whatever, whatever you choose. Um, the main idea is to prevent insecticide resistance. So you have to rotate insecticides and then prevent in, uh, pests like spider mites to become bad. And that's pest resurgence. While we are doing all this, we have to uh, protect natural enemies and pollinators. So this is kind of a broad walkthrough of IPM. Uh, and you can think of any crop and this is how you can plan your IPM. So when I'm thinking about insect management, these are the three levels of pest management. Uh, and you may not have answers to all of these for every insect. That's, that's okay, but think logically with using this framework. So again, based on who you are, um, I have kind of organized my thoughts and how I teach IPM to make it uh, bite size is uh, if you are an open field producer and you're trying to be sustainable or organic, then you have plenty of space, then you can use trap crops and bioinsecticides um, as your, your major IPM uh, plan. Um, if you are a high tunnel producer, you can use something like a permanent exclusion system and you can see a picture on your screen. That's basically a high tunnel with a shade cloth around. And, and this is part of an ongoing research uh, where that uh, Andre is helping me with, but um, that blocks, physically blocks insects, these large insects. It, it does not block all insects or beneficials, but it does bring down the moths and some of the large sting bugs, but that's called a permanent system and then using bioinsecticides. And if you're a market gardener, home gardener, small farmer uh, with few rows of uh, vegetables, then the temporary pest exclusion system, which is the right of, of on your screen, uh, and, and integrating that with bioinsecticides or biological control uh, can work very well. And within the temporary system, there are the two other levels like the fixed frame system or the movable system. And I, I do an entire talk on just exclusion system. And you can see some of the videos I've done that give you kind of a quick overview of these, but there is a lot to learn here. So today I'm going to focus on the trap crop and insecticides. So let's talk about trap cropping. And essentially um, there are several publications that I have online. Uh, they're also in multiple languages. Um, but there is one that uh, I refer to uh, quite often is the SARE publication, which is one of our funding agency. But basically uh, how we came across this trap cropping is, you know, if you give, so you're looking at a lab, uh, no choice test in the lab, and you are seeing these leaf fruit bugs and you know, most of the time they are mating uh, and they ag aggregate in large numbers uh, and totally destroy the quality of the fruit. Uh, but if you give them tomato, they will just jump to it, as you know. And they also love beans. They, are, they also love fruit crops. You name it, they're on it. So this is a no choice test where um, obviously they had nothing else but tomatoes. So they, they love the tomatoes. But as soon as you give it something like the NK300 sorghum, which is a very unique variety that we uh, we developed, or, or not, we didn't develop, it's an old uh, silage sorghum. But uh, that NK300, uh, through student research, we found that this variety has incredible properties of attracting leaf fruit bugs. And you can see in this picture, when we offer a, a choice, the leaf fruit bugs prefer to stay on that sorghum. And that's the sorghum head, which is very attractive to them. And there's like one poor guy over there in the corner of the screen on the tomato. So uh, really amazing to see that. And that we took this kind of studies and developed our field demonstrations uh, as, as we have done plenty of student research on this. So this is to show you some practical applications. If you have the space, uh, this can be done. And this is a, you're looking at 
the uh, sunflower and sorghum um, system of, of perimeter trap crop. So they are called perimeter because you have these rows of sorghum and sunflower on the outside. These trap crops are planted typically two to three weeks ahead of the main crop. And that's important. Why? Because you want your trap crop to be attractive to these insects. So the sunflower is a 50 day crop, sorghum is a 100 day crop. And we plant them two weeks ahead on the same day on the outside rows. And the sunflower is on the outside because it blooms early and it attracts those leaf footed bugs in big numbers. Uh, but because we have pollinators, we do not spray them. Uh, we do not kill or take any action. We let those sunflowers to kind of wither and die. And those leaf fruit bugs move on to the sorghum. It's really remarkable to see this system uh, work in the field. And we do it very religiously in our, in our research plots. In fact, all our research plots are mostly trap cropped. Um, but when they move into the sorghum, that's where you can kill them. And that's a attract and kill strategy. So it's really remarkable to see this in, in action. Here's another view of this plot. So now you can see the sorghum. I can see how close it is to the tomatoes. And it draws out the leaf footed bugs. Uh, in a, if it's not too high, uh, the pressure is not too terrible, then it does a really good job of drawing out the leaf footed bugs and also uh, brown sting bugs. We also have found it effective against uh, brown marmorated sting bug, which is a uh, which is the uh, invasive insect. So really amazing to see this uh, this push pull system in effect. So and you're looking at a pretty sizable tomato planting here. Uh, lots of benefits of trap crops. Uh, for example, attracting pollinators, which you all will love. Um, and I'm a big you know uh, uh, proponent of having these pollinators. We need to save them, and our trap crop actually helps to. Um, bring some ecosystem diversity, uh, additional food for these pollinators, beneficial insects. So sunflower trap crop is a really great, and this is the peridobic type sunflowers. So it has a big head. And also a number of natural enemies. In fact, I have done classes of natural enemy identification in my trap crops. Uh, they are, uh, these natural enemies are are all over in the trap crops. For example, the spiders, uh, which I have marked with that orange arrow on the top left. These are the green lynx spiders, really remarkable. They will feed and they will catch these adult leaf fruit bugs and feed, feed on them. Sirfit flies are also very attracted to the sorghum leaves um, and, and they feed on small caterpillars, aphids. Uh, we also have a tachinid fly, which is a picture on the right with the red arrow. That uh, tachinid fly will lay eggs on the head of the leaf fruit bugs, and eventually the parasite will kill that leaf fruit bug. Almost 50, 60 percent of leaf fruit bugs in trap crop are infested with it. And then you can see predators like the assassin bug and the praying mantises. So again, it's a really remarkable to see uh, the effect of trap crop, and plus we are spraying, reduce our spraying, so that directly benefits natural enemy populations. So. Um, uh, it's a big learning curve uh, as an entomologist, even for me, and we are doing it very religiously now. Just to show some quick numbers, uh, I know this is kind of an overwhelming slide, but what is going on here is if you look at the red and the blue line on your screen, those are the trap crops. So you have the first flush of leaf fruit bugs on the sunflower, which is the red line, and then the next one is the a uh, flush of uh, leaf fruit bugs on sorghum. The point is, as long as you have good trap crop, you have very low number of leaf fruit bugs on the main crop, which is tomato. Uh, the thing is, you have to plant the trap crop within a, a distance. You cannot expect miracles and plant your tomato half a mile away uh, uh, or plant your trap crop so far away that there's essentially no effect. So there are limitations to trap cropping, uh, but it is a very feasible and it works to bring the threshold uh, down so that you can manage and live with the other insects uh, and, and kind of manage the rest. So uh, it's really uh, something that we have learned over the years 
uh, doing it. We have also found out that you can stagger those trap crops. So you can plant multiple rows of trap crops, especially like in drought. Um, so essentially they're, these are like feeding the insects and keeping them busy. And you can plant extra rows of the trap crop and move them away, move the insect away from the main crop. So you're looking at the uh, multiple layers of trap cropping here. Uh, now, again, the drawback is this will take up space, uh, but it is really remarkable. If you have the space, this is well worth the effort. And this is just to show you again, when you stagger plant uh, the trap crops, as long as you have good trap crop standing, you have far fewer numbers of leaf fruit bugs on your tomato. Uh, so it's not foolproof, but it reduces your fight. Um, so, and just to show you pictures, here you're looking at the picture of tomato if you don't do anything in Alabama. So obviously, if you don't use trap crop, you don't spray your uh, chem you know, chemicals or organic, you have a really bad crop. So, uh, and you're, you're looking at live caterpillars uh, with those arrows in the picture. So it's really infested and really terrible looking with lots of stink bug, leaf fruit bug feeding. But if you do things right and practice IPM, this is what your crop could look like. So now you're looking at um, the uh, uh, tomatoes with trap crop plus BT, which is uh, one of the biologicals on the left, and then trap crop or chemical and using a chemical. You can see you have almost similar effect when you do it right. So again, the point is you have to plan for it. These things cannot happen uh, unplanned. So you have to have the products at hand, you have to plan the trap crop. So there is more steps involved and that's where it takes more time to plan this. So, but you can get in a good environment, in a good planned environment, you can get good results. Uh, and farmers are using trap crops very creatively. Here's a producer in North Alabama that actually used trap crops, uh, trap crop of sorg um, sunflower as an attraction to attract uh, uh, bypassers uh, down the road. And they would buy the stock, the sunflower stock and take it, not knowing that it's actually a functioning sun, uh, sunflower was the actual trap crop. So. Uh, there are some really creative ways farmers have done these uh, different ways. So um, I, I, we are all still learning uh, how to best utilize it. David, is my connection still okay? Because I just got a warning here that says that uh, I have a low bandwidth. Uh, everything's good on my end. Okay. All right. I'll try to finish here quickly. Um, inching closer here. So again, um, this is a a uh, pretty dense slide. Uh, I've already covered most of these things in my discussion that uh, you, know, you have to try to develop site-specific IPM plan. You know, Ideally, don't go more than 10 to 15% in trap crop. If you do more in trap crop, you'll be spending a lot more time and will cut to your, pro your, your actual production area. Uh, trap crop should be planted on good ground and make sure you have a good stand. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, uh, you, you may just use some other method. Um, uh, but in real world, we have actually worked out some of the differences it makes in terms of cost. And one of the products we used to spray, which was a very expensive pesticide, we have stopped it. It was about $50 per acre pesticide. I have completely stopped using it because we have the trap crop standing. And I can kill leafed bugs in the trap crop if, if I want to with a much lower cost pesticide on the sorghum, not the sunflower, on the sorghum and really cut back on the use of insecticide. I'm not spraying the um, tomatoes as often. Uh, uh, so again, watch the videos that are online. You will find them on our YouTube channel, Alabama Beginning Farmer uh, channel, and, and take a look. Quickly about insecticides. Uh, I don't think there's very many people on this call that have uh, or use conventional insecticides. But if you do, uh, please give me a call separately. Insecticides, you know, we have about 28 different classes of insecticides. So it's a really complicated world out there with chemicals, uh, but they essentially group into these 
four or five major categories. And majority of our conventional insecticides are insect nerve and muscle, um, uh, have insect nerve or muscle action. So, um, and the, the good thing about these insecticides is, uh, these are conventionals is they're becoming more and more selective. So if you look at the handbook, um, it's on page 160, I believe on the 2022 version of the handbook. Uh, there's a long list of pesticides and the ones that are at the bottom are much more selective insecticides, which means that they will do least harm to beneficial insects. They will do least harm to the applicator. So uh, these are much selective insecticides and they're much safer to use. So again, remember, no product is absolutely safe. Uh, so you have to be careful no matter whether you use organic or chemical insecticides, they can both be very harmful to environment if, if they are used recklessly. But this is just to kind of show you quickly what are some of the conventional ones. I think you'll like the next slide, which is this one. This is the organic insecticide uh, list that I have developed over the years and I keep working on it. Uh, in fact, I spent a lot of time today to work on this again. But um, there are about four different types of organic insecticides, uh, whether you're a home gardener or whoever, uh, there are the physical poisons, which is on the top. You'll recognize kaolin clay uh, or DE, diatomaceous earth. Uh, those are pretty popular products. You can buy them at your local co-op. Most of your organic insecticides for home gardeners or uh, small farmers, if you are going to the co-op, those belong to the contact action, which is the second column or second um, row there, uh, which includes your horticultural oils, Neem, a lot of people like neem. Uh, make sure you're buying neem with azadirectin, which is the active ingredient. Uh, pyganic or pyrethrin is very popular. Uh, insect cell soap. And remember this insect cell soap that I've listed, this is not your Dawn detergent. Uh, Dawn detergent can burn your plant, not this insect cell soaps, just be careful. Uh, we also have a lot of the microbial products listed and these are mostly contact poisons. And then you have BT, which is Dipel uh, or Zentari. Uh, the other one that you will see very common uh, at Home Depot is called Thuricide. These are all BTs, bacteria, it's a bacteria. Uh, and that's very popular among gardeners and small farmers. It works great, but you have to apply it before an outbreak. Most of these insecticides you see on the screen, uh, you have to apply before an outbreak. Uh, organic products are very difficult really they really struggle if you already have an outbreak of insects. Uh, and there are some volatile products that I don't do much testing on. I have tested the peppermint soap, which is on the bottom of the screen. Uh, one of the things with soaps and oils is uh, if you have a drought situation and the temperature is very high, you can burn your plants. So just be very careful, look at the weather, read the label and then spray. And then you have some insecticide baits, for example, for uh, slugs and ants. And I get those questions all the time. So I put this slide together so you get your answer in one shot. Uh, so again, this will be recorded. So you can always come back and watch the recording uh, on our website or Facebook. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one. Let's go to this one. Um, people ask me, where do you get these insecticides? Okay. so. Um, uh, so I have mentioned some of the uh, places where you can pick up um, these insecticides. I think making friends of the farmers cooperatives is very good um, or the local nurseries. If you have a local nursery, you can get products. You can also buy some good sprayers. Make sure you check your sprayers, uh, repair the nozzles or change the nozzles every year. If you are using some of these organic products, they are very abrasive they can really destroy your nozzle very quickly. So, and make sure you're calibrating your sprayers. We have a brand new calibration video uh, on, our, on our YouTube page uh, that you can use. Uh, and it's very informative uh, video. You can also buy organic products, home garden products online. But I have some uh, reminders that always check the expiry of these products if you're buying them online. Um, 
and uh, check the product label, make sure the label is not torn. Um, store the products in original bottle. Don't try to put your uh, insecticide in shampoo containers uh, for easy use. Keep them in the original container. And always keep these pesticides away from direct sunlight and use these products immediately after you mix them. Don't store them, don't mix them today and spray tomorrow uh, because these products get activated, especially the microbials, they get activated by uh, once you mix them. So use them immediately. This is my last slide. Um, and again, I just want to thank you for this, uh, for your patience. Thank you to David for organizing this. I hope some something good comes out of this. Uh, but just some general reminders that uh, you, know, you have to scout and look in the crop. Um, you, there's no shortcut to scouting. And take good pictures, send them to us. We'll try to identify as fast as we can. Pest prevention is better than cure. For example, trap crop and exclusion system. Those are your pest prevention strategies. Uh, and those should be tried before you use insecticides. Manage insects when the numbers are small uh, or low. They're in low numbers or the caterpillars are small. Don't let the caterpillars be big because then these organic products, even the conventional products, they struggle. Protect natural enemies. That's always the case. And try to integrate these multiple methods uh, into, a, um, into uh, one IPM tactic or strategy and keep good records. I think that's very important 